Words at War, presenting Since You Went Away. August 16th. My darling, you've been gone only a few hours, and already the house is waiting for you. I can hardly believe that you've gone. That our peculiar oneness, yours and mine and the kids, can be broken like this. Oh, I know, you had to go. But you'll have to send me large doses of your courage so that I can learn to stand on my own feet till you come back. Oh, darling, darling, write us often. All the little things, what your uniform feels like, have you had a military haircut, and most of all, what we can send to you. I love you, Anne. Words at War. Tonight, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime, brings you another in its series of radio adaptations of war books. Tonight, a story of the home front, Since You Went Away, by Margaret Buell Wilder. August 20th. Darling, I'm better today. We all are. The girls and I talk about you now, and we can go into your room without flinching. It seems shocking to be renting your room to a stranger. Everyone at Wright Field seems to have seen our ad on the bulletin board and has been phoning to ask the price. But how does one suddenly put a price on a husband's room? The first few people sounded all wrong, anyhow. About that room you advertised, how much is it? The room? Oh, um, we... The price of the room is above rubies. Above rubies? You know, like the honest woman in the Bible. Good Lord, a nut! What was the matter with that one, Maud? Oh, I don't know, Jan. She just didn't belong in your father's room. A young woman. Last time it was a young man. Well, your father told me not to admit any wolves into the home. You're just stalling. Now listen, Stinky. You got... Rig, how many times must I tell you not to call... Okay, okay. But you've got to rent Dad's room just the same. No wife and attractive growing daughters can live on a first loot salary, and you know it. Not with our ideas. I'm going to, you two, but don't be in such a rush. It's indecent. The room's hardly cold yet. We're just being practical, but you never will. Brig, it's up to us to support ourselves. And I've got an idea for me right now. Oh, where's the phone book? What are you going to do? Brig, you go to the door. I've got a phone. Did you put the street number in the ad, too, Mud? Yes, but I thought that all phone first. How do? Name of Hilton? Yes. I've come to inspect the room. Inspect it? Are you from the Board of Health? This is my mother, Mrs. Hilton. How do? How do? I'm certainly not from the Board of Health. I'm Colonel McCulloch Flaherty, RAF, on duty at Wright Field. I'm thinking of taking your room. Oh. You are. Where is it? Um, it's upstairs. Colonel, shall I take you up for inspection? Rig, don't rush the Colonel. Um, Colonel... I really don't think you'd like the room. Well, why not? My mother's just being modest, Colonel. It's a lovely room. Mud, shall I take the Colonel up, or will you? I'll go, of course. <laughs> this way, Colonel. Sorry. Thank you. I've been at field only a short time. Who's that gone upstairs with Mother? Oh, Jan, he's perfect. He looks like dough. Not a sign of the wolf. I think he began stalling again, but I beat her down. Good, now we're getting somewhere. And guess what I've got? What? A job. I'm a sitter. I'm going to sit with Mrs. Bentley's brats in the evenings at 25 cents an hour. And she just knows that heaps of her friends will use me, too. I bet I make three or four dollars a week. Oh, Jan, you suppose I could be a sitter, too? Oh, no, you're too young. Nobody trusts a 13-year-old. Since when did nobody... Really just what I'd hoped for. Really? Just one or two questions. Are there any noisy little children in the house? Well, only these two here. And you can see we're simply bowed with years. Of course, if it's the noise you're worrying about, there is soda. Yes, so does our bulldog. He used to have a wife named Whiskey. He does snore pretty loud. Bulldog, eh? I like bulldogs. Well, I rather think I'll take the room. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, you will. Listen, Colonel, I've got an idea. You don't want to go dragging yourself out to some lousy diner for breakfast. 
Maybe I could make a deal with you. Serve you breakfast in your room. I'd only charge you ten cents for service, and I'm sure Mother would give you food at cost. Wouldn't you, Stinky? <laughs> <laughs> Colonel, it's just as well you see us as we are right away. I'm a poor, helpless woman overrun by these two Amazons. But our home, such as it is, is open to you, and I hope you'll be happy in it. September 4th. Mr. Lieutenant, you will be happy to learn that Fidelia approves of our paying guest. Remember how in the old days, when she was our own full-time cook, she used to look each dinner guest over to see if they were worthy of us? <laughs> well, it seems she was shocked at the idea of a gentleman on the premises, but the colonel's age and title have mollified her. Both the kids' financial projects are booming also. So that leaves me the only drone. And every day I'm sure that I have to go to work too. First there's the money. Or rather, there isn't the money. What with your extra uniforms there in Texas and our ridiculous tastes here like symphony concerts and three meals a day, well, you can see. And besides, there's the feeling that with you doing so much, I've got to do something too. Surely four years of college and 15 years of you, darling, have fitted me for something. September 14th. Dear Lieutenant, which news will you have first, the good or the bad? I remember how you always used to eat the cherry off the ice cream first bite, which seemed to show a very improvident streak. So I guess you'd like the good first. Here goes. There was a letter from Sandy today. Fidelia brought it to me. It's from New York, Miss Hilton. Oh, from Mr. Willett. You remember him, Fidelia? Yes. He always come to dinner with paint on his fingernails. <laughs> That's because he's an artist. Let's see. Fidelia, he's coming to Dayton. He's in the army and he's going to be at Wright Field. He says, so you and I will go out every night and talk about Tim and drop tears into our beer. Hooray, hooray, Sandy. You ain't going out with another young gentleman when your husband's gone, Miss Hilton. It ain't fitting. Oh, Fidelia, don't be stuffy. Mr. Tim will be thrilled. So that's the good news, Tim. Now brace yourself for the other. Where, well, my good lieutenant, is our check? Here it is, the 14th of the month, and not a peep out of Washington. I've waited several days, but this morning I really blew up. What is all this? Did I only imagine we were supposed to get an allotment from the government? Now, nah, Miss Hilton, the check will come. But when, Fidelia? I haven't a cent, and look at all these bills. I'm going to wire to Washington. You ain't going to wire the president. I'd like to. I want Western Union, please. Now, nah, Miss Hilton. Western Union, take a message. Army Finance Office, Washington, D.C. Cannot understand outrageous delay... Sending allotment check to wife of Lieutenant Timothy, Timothy, Hilton, Dayton, Ohio. Do you think I'm made of money? Send check immediately. Ann Hilton. Oh, an operator. Send the wire, collect. Miss Hilton, here's the colonel. Oh, good morning, colonel. Mrs. Hilton, am I correct? Did I hear you sending that abusive message to the army? I'd have sent words if Western Union would have taken it. Here my husband deliberately throws up a good job to volunteer in the army. to send, to say, send check immediately to the army. Was it so terrible, Colonel? But I need the money. Oh, well, perhaps you'd allow me the convenience of a small loan oh, until... Oh, thanks. Yes, ten dollars would be nice. That way we can at least live until the army arrests us. But this has decided me, Tim, darling. I'm definitely going to get a job. Frightens me, this being so dependent. Shows me how helpless I've always been, leaning on you for everything. After my blow-up, I was still stomping around the house muttering when Emily Hawkins strolled in. You don't know Emily. She's taken a room in the house next door. She's a divorcee. I think her husband got tired of her and left her, and it's made her kind of bitter. 
Anyway, she's all alone, and she's taken to hanging around my neck. Hello, Anne. What's the matter? Hello. Oh, I'm just stewing over my allotment check from Tim. I'm broke, and it hasn't come. Did he have it made over to you? Of course. And now he stopped it. He? He hasn't stopped anything. It's just some bookkeeper or something. Oh, are you sure that he didn't stop it? <laughs> of course I am. Why should he? Well, couldn't he just possibly be having it made over to somebody else? Another woman? Another woman? Oh, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> Darling, I think it's marvelous the way you two trust each other. It's just amazing. Really, it is. Just sweet. Why are some people incapable of believing in voluntary fidelity? If I didn't feel so sorry for her, I'd break her neck. And I'm ashamed of bothering you with such nonsense. It's just... I feel so lonely. You suppose I'll ever learn to be grown up and self-reliant? Will I ever learn to miss you any less? September 17th. Darling, it's a new world. The kids and I were doing a spot of house cleaning when the postman came floating by on the wings of an angel. Jan brought me the magic envelope. It's the check. Look, it's the check. Oh, is there ever a more beautiful sight? Let's see the envelope. Look, it's postmarked the 5th. It was just held up in the mail somewhere. Oh, really? We told you not to blow your top, Stinky. Well, let this be a lesson to you. And now, a present for a good girl. A letter from Dad. Jan... Dearest three, just a line, but a nice one. It looks as if maybe your old man will be having leave oh, soon. Oh, so keep the candle talk? shining in the window a little longer. There's the mess call, so no more for now. Love, me. Oh, kids, isn't it wonderful? Wonderful. Gosh, I wonder when he'll get here. Doesn't matter so long as he's coming. Oh, think of having him here again. Hearing him whistle our signal down the street and then seeing him walk in the door. So big, he fills the whole room. Oh, I feel all young again. <laughs> no worries, no responsibilities, no nothing. October 16th. Mr. Pudding, you are now the husband of a woman of affairs. <laughs> Just a tiny office job out at the field, but at least I'm pulling my weight. And if the check's late again, there won't be any more hysterics. Am I growing up? I don't think so. Because all I still want is for you to come back home so I can be the clinging vine again. When are you coming, darling? Has your commanding officer forgotten your leave? Shall I send him a reminder? Maybe a postcard, like the Negro spiritual. Let my husband go. <laughs> Shall I... Oh, there's the doorbell. It's an hour later now. Oh, Tim, I'm sunk. Why do they go promising leaves and then canceling them like this? How do they know I can wait till Christmas to see you? The blow wasn't lightened any by Dee or Emily. Oh, isn't that too bad, dear? Or, or don't you really care so very much? Don't I care? Well, you seem to be doing all right out at Wright Field with all those stunning officers. Now, look here, Emily. I took that job because I needed the money. After all, my husband's only a lieutenant. Hmm... That's what I think is so funny. Oh, not your husband, dear. I'm sure he's just bursting with patriotism. But all these other men, 40-year-olds, simply rushing away from their homes into the services. I can't understand it. Unless, of course, they're really just getting away from their wives. The war's a wonderful excuse, isn't it? Tim, I know she's just jealous. I shouldn't let her upset me. Oh, darling, there wasn't anything like that in it, was there? You weren't just hankering for one last fling before middle age. Tell me I'm a fool. Please, tell me I'm crazy. November 9th. Mr. Pudding, dear, I do wish you could have been here today. Sandy arrived, and what a scene. A cab charged up to the door as Fidelia and Emily and I were standing on the front porch. 
He was nursing an oil painting as tall as himself. Hello! 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 Andy, hey. hello. How are you? And I'm so glad. Dale, you wonder woman! <laughs> How did do, Mr. Willis? <gasps> Sandy, this is our neighbor, Mrs. Hawkins. How Mrs. do you do? Mrs. <laughs> and here, Mrs. Hilton, is a present for your home. Oh, painting. Turn it around. Let's see it. <laughs> there. I did it. Oh, my <gasps> goodness. Really, Sandy? Mr. Willis, come in up this minute. Oh, Sandy. <laughs> you didn't carry a life-size nude through the streets of Dayton. Well, sure. Everybody loved it. <laughs> I'll bet they did. <laughs> now, listen here, Mr. Willis. You got no business bringing a floozy like that into a house where there's young girls. I'm going to hang my apron over decent like until you get it out of here down to your hotel. Hotel? Oh, I'm not going to a hotel. I'm going to stay right here. Aren't I, Anne? Here? Um, well, I never... Sandy, I don't know how you can. But I made all my plans. Oh, Sandy. Well... Well, just for a night or two, then. Well, I think that'll be lovely, Anne. Now you'll have someone to liven things up a little. I'm sure your husband will be delighted. Of course he'll be delighted. Sandy and he are old friends. Come on in, Sandy. Stay as long as you like. And we'll find a place with a good light where you can hang your lady friend. <laughs> November 14th. Dear Mr. Pudding, I've hardly seen Sandy yet. He's off at the field all day. Brig gives him early breakfast with the colonel, but he doesn't tip her as the colonel does, and she's developing a real head waiter's chilliness. <laughs> and speaking of Brig, your daughter, Mr. Pudding, is almost more than I can cope with. What with Sandy here, I've had to move out of my room and into the girls with them. And only now do I realize what poor Jan has been putting up with every night. Rig, aren't you ever going to get into bed and turn out the lights? Jan and I want to go to sleep. I'll be through soon. But you've been padding around for half an hour, and I can't see that you've accomplished a thing. I've washed my undies and ironed a blouse and had a shower and put my hair up in curlers and laid out my clothes for tomorrow. I think it's been a very full half hour. And now you're going to bed and turn out the lights. Don't flatter yourself, Maud. She's hardly begun yet. Jan. Brig, now really... She'll spend 15 minutes yet polishing her shoes, saddle soap first, then Neat's foot oil, then ordinary polish. Then she'll go downstairs to kiss Soda goodnight and put Miss Cat out. And when she's halfway up again, she'll remember she didn't sharpen her pencils for school tomorrow. So she'll go back down and do that. I've already done that. And then she'll put Tyrone Power's picture under a pillow and water the window box. Not tonight. I only do that every other night. Well, thank you for small favors. What do you do tonight? Just feed the turtle and take care of the goldfish. That's what I'm doing now. How do you take care of the goldfish, for heaven's sake? I just scrub the inside of his bowl and take out the shells to air overnight. Oh, for goodness sake. What's that you're doing to him now? I'm just putting him in a teacup for the night. Brig, honestly, what for? To rest him, of course. <laughs> oh, Brig, don't be absurd. Come on now, go to bed. Oh, well, I've got to say my prayers anyway. Well, hurry up. Dear Father in heaven, this is Brig Hilton in Dayton. Please make me a good girl and let me pass my algebra test tomorrow. And let me get on the basketball team, because I really think I'm better at dribbling than Virginia Bentley. And bless Soda and Miss Cat, and take care of Wussy's departed soul and the white rabbit and that poor little sparrow I found today. And bless all the teachers and Jan and Muddy Especially take care of Daddy down in Texas. Make him a good soldier. And bring him back safe on leave at Christmas. Amen. Okay, I'm ready for bed now. November 24th. Tim, I'm frantic. What did you mean in your letter? It just might be that you won't hear from me again for a while. What's happened? Tim, oh, please, don't let it be that you... I can't write it. It's too fantastic. People don't get sent abroad right from training school. Or do they? I've just phoned you long distance. I just wanted to know where you were. But no one knew, or else they wouldn't tell me. Does that mean... what I'm scared to death it means? <laughs> Thank you. 
November 28th. Tim, where are you? You've just disappeared into thin air. I'm ashamed of getting panicky like this. And the kids are being swell. It's all right now, Mommy. Steady. But where is he, Jan? We don't know, Mommy. But you know, Dad. He can always take care of himself. Remember the time when the steering wheel went bust? I know, but this is worse. He may have sailed and we have... No, ha Dad would never go without getting word to you somehow. Who's that? Oh, Colonel. Please, could you come in here a minute? Evening, ladies. Colonel, you know where Tim's gone, don't you? Please tell me. Mrs. Hilton, I... I can't. Oh, aid and comfort to the enemy, I know. But I'm not the enemy, I'm his wife. I'm not going to send to the Germans and say, my husband's just sailed, please come and torpedo him. I know how you feel. Well, here's this much. He hasn't sailed yet. But he's going to. Where? Which way, east or west? I don't know, really. I just know it'll be soon. I'm not going to see him. If only I knew I could go to him, I could get to New York tomorrow, but then he might be in San Francisco. How am I going to stand it? Hang on to yourself, Mommy. You've still got us. Oh, Jan, darling, I know. And I'm so grateful for that. There's the phone. Maybe it's him. Hello. This is Timothy Hilton. Speaking. This is Western Union. Yes. I have a telegram for you. Read it, please. Dearest, no chance to write or phone. We'll send APO number later. Cannot say more now. Don't worry. All my love, Tim. Thank you. Wait a minute. Where is the wire from, please? New York City. Yes, I see. Thank you. He's in New York. He's going to sail from New York. You're not going to try to see him? No. No. He's standing on his own feet there. Just got to try to stand on mine here. <laughs> My dearest, I suppose our letters will get to you in batches now, wherever it is they're going. So will our presents. At the moment, the kids are down on the floor surrounded by tags and wrapping paper, and the colonel is explaining the war to Sandy in a corner. Now, you understand that this theory depends on our completely winning the Mediterranean. Oh, sure, sure. Now, you know, Brig, I think maybe I ought to take the sleeves out of this sweater after all. If Dad goes to Africa, he'll want to be cool. Then he won't wear the sweater at all. Oh. Never mind, Jan. They say the nights are very cold in Africa. You know, these things aren't going to get to him by Christmas. It may be months. Maybe we oughtn't to put Merry Christmas on the cards. Maybe we ought to put Happy Lincoln's birthday or do them up in hearts and flowers for Valentine's Day. No, we made them for Christmas presents and we're going to stick to our story. Gee, it's going to be queer, Christmas without Pop. Don't talk about it, Jan. It's the first time in my whole life I've ever dreaded Christmas coming. What are you planning for, Anne? A party? Oh, no, Sandy, I can't somehow. With Tim out on the ocean, the storms, the submarines... Mud's been seeing too many movies... She's had him torpedoed every day since he left. Oh, look here, Ann. Even if you don't feel like a party for yourself, how about taking pity on the colonel and me? Yes, Mrs. Hilton. Two stray bachelors. You'd be doing a good Christian deed. You mean you want to? This isn't just be kind to the Hilton's week? Uh, certainly not. You're all self. Oh, oh well, that's a party. Well, so well, I'll answer it, I Mud. think that's grand. I'm, I'm glad you suggested it. Hello? Yeah, my phone for you. Oh, thank you, Lori. Dear Mrs. Hawkins. Oh, dear. Emily. <laughs> Hello, Emily. Hello, Anne. Look, I was just thinking Christmas is coming. Well, telepathy, we were just talking about Christmas Eve. I know you're going to feel all lonely and deserted Christmas Eve, so I wondered if you and the girls would have dinner with me at the hotel. Christmas Eve? Well, that's awfully nice of you to invite us, Emily. Oh, no, oh, Mother, not that, no. But I'm afraid we've made other plans. Oh, oh say fine, I like. Well, you mean Thank you, you can't? can't? I'm afraid not, Emily. Well, I just hate to think of your being all alone at Christmas. Oh, for gosh sakes. Mother, I'll kill you. Look, Emily, if you're going to be all alone, we're just having a quiet family party here. We're dished now. Why don't you join us? Oh, Emily, Anne, how lovely I did store it. Well, that's fine, Emily. We'll make arrangements later. All right, thank you, Anne. Good night. Good night. Traitor. So now, this is Be Kind to Dumb Emily's Week. I'm sorry, fellas. I just couldn't help it. Suppose it had been Tim. 
all alone at Christmas. Late Christmas Eve. My dearest, I'm hanging on hard to all the faith I have. I insist that you're all right. Though it's been four weeks since you went away, tonight is when I need you most of all, remembering other Christmas Eves we've had. I've tried to be brave and self-reliant, Tim. I've tried never to doubt that that peculiar oneness of ours had never been broken, really. But now, with everyone going to bed and the house so silent, lonely, I keep thinking of the story Emily told at dinner. Well, I the get back to camp. Oh, speaking of soldiers, and what do you hear from Tim? I haven't heard. Not at all? Not even a cable? Isn't that queer? It takes much longer than that sometimes. Come on, Ann, I'll pull a cracker with you. Oh, Sandy. Go ahead, pull. That's it. Now get out your paper hat. Oh, Anna looks darling in a paper hat. Mommy looks darling in anything. Dan's keeping up my morale. You see, my dress hasn't a train like yours, Emily. Oh, it's a sunbonnet. Just my type. <laughs> there. How do I look? Oh, <laughs> just darling. Oh, by the way, speaking of the sunbonnet type reminds me of the strangest story I heard the other day. Just shows what queer things happen in wartime. It seems there was a soldier whose wife was just a nice, plain, homebody type. And, of course, he'd left her back home. Well, after he'd been in the army some months, she received a wire from camp that said, going overseas and you may not hear from me for a long time. And she didn't, not for about six months. Had the ship been sunk? Oh, don't let's talk about the war. Jan, let's get Bing Crosby on the radio. No, Frank Sinatra. What had happened, Emily? Well, she finally wrote to Washington, and she found out that he'd never been out of the country at all. Never left America? Could that happen? There are liars in the army as everywhere else. Oh. You mean he disappeared like that on purpose? Mm-hmm. Seems so. But why? Well, that's the queer part. In normal times, he'd probably never have dreamed of leaving his wife. But now at camp, there, there was this young officer in the wax, and she was brilliant and attractive, and she was all mixed up with this strange new life of his, and, well, anyway, that's the story. Shall we go into the sitting room for our coffee? Will you get the tray? Yes. Colonel, you'll find cigars beside the fire. Yes. Oh. Come on, Mrs. Hawkins. So you see, darling, the evening was less than perfect. But I don't think Emily enjoyed it either. The men treated her like a cockroach and bustled her home as early as they could. But in a way, she had still had the last word. Honey, there's the phone. Probably Emily to apologize. Hello. Mrs. Timothy Hilton? Yes. London is calling you. London? London, England? Yes. Will you take the call? Yes, oh, yes. This is a non-military call, but the enemy may be listening in, so be careful what you say. I will, I will, yes. You may go ahead now. Go ahead, London. Hello, Anne? Tim? Merry Christmas, darling. Oh, Tim, darling, is that you? Sure, it's me. Oh, Tim, you're all right, aren't you? You're all right. Oh, thank God. Sure, I'm all right. Hey, hold on to yourself, old lady. I will, I will now. Oh, darling, I've been so worried, so scared. But I'll behave myself from now on, really, I will. Hey, don't you worry about me. That's what I've been doing about you. Everything all right? Everything's perfect. You're safe and you've called me and I love you. Say it, darling. The enemy won't care. I love you, man. I love you. There. That's all I needed. Oh. <laughs> And if Hitler wants to start gossiping, let him make the most of it. As the 14th program of Words at War, we have brought you passages from Since You Went Away by Margaret Buell Wilder. The work was adapted for radio by Nora Sterling of the NBC script staff. Since You Went Away is now being made into an all-star motion picture production by David O. Selznick.